Welcome to the SurfCast Podcast, your weekly source for surf fishing discussions, tactics, interviews, news, and more. The SurfCast Podcast is hosted by Jerry Adet and Toby Lipinski, two of the most dedicated and obsessed surf fishermen that you will ever meet. The tide is up, the wind is at our back, so let's hit the surf. So, Shell, you are out fishing today? Absolutely. I fish every day uh, this season, almost. Uh, today is like the middle of December. Started out at daybreak, uh, tried some soft baits for the, the sandy limitations, and then about 8, 30, 9 o'clock, the birds started showing up and game on. They were on mid-sized bunker, and the fish were all on top water. Pencil poppers, some were on metal and swimmers, some on soft baits like the shads and stuff. But uh, middle of December, it's amazing. The fishery this year has been Phenomenal bunker run's been off the chart the whole fall. Wow, wow! I, I gotta say, I'm jealous. I was on my computer at eight o'clock, nine o'clock this morning. Not, I was thinking you about. Gotta fishing, come to New Jersey. Now. You gotta come was, to New Jersey. I was just down there, but I didn't get a chance to fish. <laughs> I know. I heard. I heard from a few people. Nick Cicero told me he saw you down there. Yep. Yeah, from the Wilson Show. Right. Yes. But, yeah. I'm jealous. Yeah. It was an amazing day, and you know, you it, it's hard to you know predict it but it, it, it happened and it, we're hoping it's going to continue the weather is on the cold side but the water is right around 50 51 degrees from what i'm told so they're not gonna they're not gonna stop biting you know until mm. that gets below that 45 degree mark wow. and and, and the, the bunker has been insane that's the primary bait the whole season so far yeah mm-hmm. well we're definitely going to talk about that do you think you'll go into january i did last year my last day was i think around the fourth and I had some keeper sized fish that day and then got real cold the following day and kind of packed it in. I took my cooler rack off my four wheel drive and said, uh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, this is this is the uh, Surfcast podcast. I'm Jerry. And I am Toby. And today we have Shelly Karras, uh, a, a very well known New Jersey fisherman for many decades now. Uh, I don't, I've never met you shell in person, but when I was putting together my seminar series, I was asking around, I said, who can I talk to in New Jersey? And I asked a whole bunch of people and there was one name that came up over and over and it was yours. Uh, and from all kinds of different anglers for all kinds of different perspectives who do all kinds of different things and boat guys, et cetera, et cetera. And they all said, you gotta talk to Karis. You gotta get, you got, he's the man he's been around forever. He knows everything. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and he's the man. He's the man. So you got to get him on. And so that's how we started talking. And now we talked on the phone a few times. It's supposed to come down and fish with you because of my knee. I didn't get a chance to. But we have some we have some plans for this spring. So hopefully we'll be able to make that happen. So thank you for coming on and welcome to the Surfcast Podcast. It's my pleasure. So yeah, thank you. Thanks you've for already... coming on. Was... Go ahead. Sorry, Toby. You've already sort of uh, hit on our topic for this evening. Uh, it's evening when we're recording this. Um, and that's bunker in the surf, because that seems to be really critical for your success over the last few years. But can you give us some perspective on like the history of what it's been like in the past? Sure. Um, I, well, I started, the bunker started uh, showing up around 1969 for me. Uh, I lived in Belmar at that time, and uh, so that's every June they would show up right after the herring run. We would have bunkers come in the full moon in June. And what happened in 1969, they got decimated. All of the netters came in, these factory ships with the Persaners, and the bunker population was 80% from what I was told below what there, what there was prior to that. So they were wiping them out. So they would try to put some moratoriums on it, and as time went on, Unfortunately, um, they kept netting them. These uh, mega ships would come up from the south. You had them coming from the north, and they would be these persaners, which were taking all these bunker on inside the three mile limit. And they would come through with spotter planes, which was key for them to locate them. And they would wipe out, I mean, the, whatever schools, they could be football fields of schools of bunker, and they would wipe them out in one day. And then they had bycatches as a weak fish stripers and bluefish that were in their nets also that got decimated wow. so it was uh, it was challenging and that lasted right through into the 90s and now um the last i'm gonna say 15 20 years 
those ships aren't there like they were. They, they can't come within that three mile zone. Uh, I think the Persaners that are bait guys, they, they're allowed like 6,000 pounds a day. And there's not many of them doing it. So we see a big resurgence of bunker the last number of years. And it's been epic. And that's why these big fish are around, you know, because that's their main diet. Mm, interesting. You know, so, it was sad, but it's gotten a lot better. So we hope it continues. Now, but when those when those bunker boats first came in, that was the same, basically the same like omega protein, the same deal coming into what they're using them for. They were shipping them away for the same uh, uh, yeah. end product. Yeah, no, a lot of it, I guess, was for fertilizer also, but it was in mm -hmm. um, in, in the um, what is it the uh, pharmaceutical, not pharmaceutical but makeup. The makeup oh, industry yeah. was using it for whatever their lotions and yeah. things and oils for their skin. Where they were, that was you know, valuable. And uh, that was that was one of the problems, you know. And I guess it went into pills that the people, you know, omega fish oils and stuff like that, possibly also. But uh, we don't see those ships like we did, you know, anymore. Thank God. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So something you said that's interesting to me, we're going to get to, we're going to talk primarily about the fall, I think, but you mentioned right. June. Do you get a lot of bunker in June? Does that matter nowadays? Like, do you get on bites on fish in June? The last uh, couple of years, it's not as good as prior springs. Um, about 15, 20 years ago, we would get a, a whole month of June. And it, well, it started like mid-May, to be honest. The schools would come up from either the south or from offshore. And we would get tremendous uh, pencil popper bites and all through Ocean and Monmouth County. You heard of uh, Jetty Country back in the day before the replenishment. Mm -hmm. And we would get phone calls with bunkers are a mile up the beach and they're in Asbury Park or they're up in Deal or Sandy Hook. And we would travel you know, north if we had to. And then they would come in on West Winds, which is primary for that. They would come in and we would have these great bites. So, yeah, absolutely. It started in June. But the fall is the best time you know it's, especially when the, the peanut bunker and the adult bunker are around in the spring you don't see peanuts up in the surf the backwaters have them but not in the surf yeah we saw some um, we saw some weird peanuts stuff going on here this spring for like the first time in a very long time which was weird wasn't that toby that was here that was this year wasn't it, it was kind of weird Something yeah and before in my area before we had all the rain like that rain yeah. flooding we had in july messed everything up yeah it was a it was just it wasn't good <laughs> very very not typical though very untypical yeah yeah very good. shell i had a question that you so you're saying those bunker would show up come in whatever in june did you so before that they weren't around they weren't in the estuaries the backwaters you wouldn't see them anywhere they were basically not around let's say april may and then they'd come in from wherever they were wintering at that point um no they were in uh they would come into the raritan uh mm -hmm. early on and uh, wow. that fight has been like they they kill, they call it now the new Cape Cod Canal, <laughs> yeah. and that fishery has been off the chart. Uh, and then that started in March, believe it or not. The bunkers show up earlier and earlier. Years ago, it was later, uh, but I guess with the war, with the climate changing and global warming, if you want to call it that, the water gets warmer earlier, and they seem to come in sooner. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that. Uh, it's it, it definitely March was pretty good this past year and okay. April. And what's nice about it, they, they, you know, the size limit on the stripers changed. So a lot of those fish this past spring were, they could keep them because they were over 34 inches and you were allowed to do it. Now with that 31 or bigger next spring, which they're, if they do come back in that uh, time frame again, they won't be allowed to harvest them. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, that is a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I got on that rare Territon bite a little bit with my friend Tom. It's pretty remarkable. There's a lot of boats out there. <laughs> there were a lot of boats. Oh, yeah. It was pretty wild. That's for sure. It's parking yeah, lot. Yeah, I, I go up there. I do it from the shore, basically. But the boat guys do really, really well. Yeah. You know? mm. And it's all adults, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the fall. Let's talk about the okay. fall. So when you're fishing you know, for bunker in the wash, aside from snagging a bunker, obviously, which, you know, we don't approve of, uh, you know, what are the plugs that you're looking for? Let's start there. So like, what are the plugs that you look for now? What are you pulling out of your bag now? Um, depends how, you know, when you say in the wash, are we talking like basically, you know, a short cast or is it a long cast? 
if it's a long cast, I'm going to um, I'm going to put on a pencil popper. Probably that's going to be my go to when they're close enough with a metal lip swimmer. That's my go to automatically. If I could reach them with a metal lip because it's a tantalizing action. It's like a wounded bunker. Um, I usually like, you know, I want it on top if I'm fishing a metal lip swimmer. I don't want it to go subsurface. Uh, I like to pick the ones that have a single belly hook now instead of the double trebles. I put a flag in the back of them. And then as far as the colors, uh, white, white and yellow, uh, chartreuse and white. I don't like bunker color lures per se, if you want to like to match the hatch exactly. But what my, my key is when if it's a white plug, they're going to see it. If it's a white and yellow, they see it. If it's that bunker color, it may blend in too much with the surroundings and they won't key in on it. I want that to stand out. And that, that's usually what I'm looking for when it, in, the, in the wash. Uh, slow retrieve, naturally, um, and, and having it on that surface. But if it's a pencil popper, or just that piston motion when you're working a pencil popper, not like bluefish speed, let's say. I want to be uh, like a piston working where you want that walk the dog side to side action on it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're when you're bouncing your pencil popper, are you looking for a consistent, even back and forth? Do you try to break it up a little bit? I'm thinking like when I'm fishing with my son and I, I tell him to throw top water, I tell him not the same motion, you know, it, right. make it yeah. splash and then dart and stop and change it up. How do you how do you feel on that subject? Same thing. You know, I'll, I'll get that side to side and then a pause. And, and, that, and when you're reeling, I don't want that same steady retrieve constantly. I'll, I'll, I'll mix it up a little bit. I might speed it and then slow it down and even stop for a second. And I'll hit it on that pause a lot of times. Uh, if it's too fast, you, you get a lot of misses. <laughs> so, you know, I, I learned that up in the canal, believe it or not. You know, locally, I remember way back, uh, a guy was from the Asbury Park Fishing Club, and um, they used pencil poppers up there all the time. And the Barnica guys, we really didn't use them as often. So I'm up there in one of the bites, and uh, he came up to me, and uh, he said, no, I know that you're a good fisherman, this and that. He said, you really got to slow it down a little bit. You're going a little bit too fast. Do that piston motion, and I started doing it, and um, my re I was re rewarded constantly by doing it that way. So I'm always looking to learn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's 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 a good point right there. That it, you, you took the advice and 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 like you said, willing to learn from it and hear from it, and obviously improve. He was he was kind of afraid to say it to me because like that's why you know I don't know how you know he kind of felt about it, but I uh, didn't want to like put me down. And I go, no, absolutely, I'll take criticism. If I learn one little thing, I'm a better fisherman than I was two minutes ago. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting, Shell. I, I was gonna tell you, you kind of beat me to it, but I mean that's a pretty valuable lesson. I mean, you've been fishing for a long time and know what you're doing, and you really, I mean, he walked up to you, told you, and you handle it just like that. Like, thanks, great, moving on, like better, right? Absolutely. You now it's important, and I tell a lot of people when I give advice and everything, you know, it's constructive criticism. It's going to make you a better fisherman. You know, don't take it the wrong way. I don't know everything. I didn't invent fishing. People always showed me things, you know. But, uh, yeah, I've been doing it a few years, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing it a little <laughs> while. <laughs> so that's the pencil popper when it when they're at distance you got the metal lip when they're reachable is that kind of been what you've always thrown is that like your primary or you know through the years did it evolve did things come in and out of the mix of your go-to offerings when the, yeah. the bunker in the wash um soft baits changed it too you know which came out you know more recent you know early on it was always you know like the stan gibbs pencil poppers from back in the day and um you know, some of the custom ones, but um, over the years, the soft baits, the tsunami um, swim shads were phenomenal this past fall. The three ounce, the heavy three ounce imitated the medium sized bunker, and we were catching 45 inch fish plus this fall on them. So, nice. soft baits are important. You got to have a smorgasbord in your bag. Um, so, I'm carrying that uh, different sizes and, you know, the hoagies, uh, anything that's going to imitate, you know, the bunker size. I'm going to have. Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting to hear that, that it's for the, you know, the basic minus adding in those soft plastics. It's kind of, those are the staples. They're what work. They've proven themselves. So you're sticking to it. So it makes sense. But again, willing to listen and change and evolve when the soft plastics come into the mix. So. Right. And, um, and also white, white is the primary color on mm -hmm. the soft plastics. I mean, they do make a bunker looking one. Uh, it will catch to a degree, but the white outfishes them. Like I'm going to say 10 to one. 
Interesting. <laughs> so no, there'll be guys around, other guys, and not, not just me, but if guys are throwing white ones and somebody next to them is throwing the other color and the white one's producing, you know, you got to say, hey, I'm going to throw a white one. It's just showing up. It's simple. Yeah. So, Especially, yeah, go ahead. Let me ask you about the, uh, the metal lip. Go back to that for a second. A lot of times you're fishing fairly calm conditions. Are you throwing metals? Metal lips, excuse me, not metals. When it's a little bit rougher, do you, do you have? I mean, because obviously, as you already mentioned, you gotta have the right wind for the bunker. You're looking for those west winds primarily, correct? Right. Well, the, yeah, the west wind's important because they swim towards it. But there's times like this past uh, week, there were a couple of northeasters, not strong, where we had good wave activity and the bait got trapped. So when that happens, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's game on. But with the metal lips, you got to time your cast if there's wave action. I'll I'll wait for that series of waves, and when when it's you know getting closer to me, then I'll make my cast to get beyond it so the lure could track better, and they single it out. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's an important thing. Yeah, when, when you're referencing that west wind, just for listeners' reference, you're along the Jersey Shore, so the 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 coastline is primarily north south. So a west wind is coming off of the shore at your back, going out to sea. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like today. Mm -hmm. and, and the water was flat. It was pancake water today, uh, <laughs> which helped. I mean, the bait was there. We had a tremendous amount of bird play, which is key. And they were moving super duper fast. And we were all wondering what the bait was because some guys on the beach are saying, oh, it's sand eels. And I'm going, it's not sand eels. I mean, they're on top water like that. They're not hitting the sand. Uh, you no, know, that that imitation. And they were moving so fast. We were wondering if it was bigger than the peanut size because peanuts usually are not as fast moving and then they weren't the big adults because they usually you'll see them getting blown out of the water and uh the, the birds were on that bait and the seagulls normally aren't on the adult size bunker very rare they might hover on it but they're not actively trying to feed on it because they're just too big but if it's peanuts and something a little bit larger than a peanut they're trying to eat them and they take advantage of it so that was key today we were if you found a bird you found a fish and we were leapfrogging with our trucks we were mobile today you know i yeah. did probably burnt about a half a tank of gas <laughs> <laughs> nice. yes yeah, so that that medium size i love finding i i refer to them as like the candy bar size they're perfect because everybody yeah. can eat them oh. the little ones the big cupcakes. ones yeah, they they're bite cupcakes. size, everything. Yeah. Can, I, I love seeing that side. I mean, I'll take the adults because you generally think big fish, but there is right. something attractive to all fish about that middle size there. So, kind of easier to get down mm -hmm. <laughs> and get another one. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah. but you're, so you are not afraid though to throw that metal lip if there's a little bit of wave action, a little bit of white water, a little bit of wind, right? Because I, I think a lot of guys are afraid to throw a top water metal lip if there's even the slightest hint of a wave or a wind they they pack them away right. not you you're if you're getting out there you want to get that metal lip out there right well i got the ones i'm using they're they're like three to four ounce uh metal lips and they got that pikey lip to it so that it, it, it'll dig a little bit but it's still on the surface you know it's not that surfster lip which in way in a heavier wave situation it's going to it's going to tumble on you this rolls it out. so mm -hmm. that that you don't want that to happen you want it to track Good. Hmm. Yeah, I was wondering about that. If it was straight surface you were you were targeting, or that you know top foot roughly. But yeah, with the pikey lips, they stay in that within within range of the surface. Yeah, I want it. I want it to be on top if I can make that wake on the top because it just looks injured to them and they take advantage of it. And we're, I'm using one. I got five O's on all on my bigger metal lips, just one treble and then a flag in the back. Mm -hmm. I just stay away from the double hooks if I can. Yeah, and a five o that's a big ball. five o that's a big hook to hang on to the fish. That makes a huge difference in landing something of quality, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, they they're they're, they're strong. The five o's <laughs> are not bending generally. Yeah, Hopefully you not. A, you get a bigger gap too, right? That's the other thing. A lot. You, of, you could get the, you have to take it off the uh, fish. What I use most of mine, I get off without a pair of pliers. Mm -hmm. It's good to hear you're going the single hook because Jerry and I are both. Big, big proponents of that. I mean, yeah. sort of independently Wait, I mean, of each other. Single, single, single treble. Single oh. treble on it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we kind of like independently came to that, and now it's you know like that's what we do. There's there's only one plug that I still fish, 
that I run more than one treble on just because it's almost 14 inches long and it needs it to balance properly. But everything else, it, it's great to hear you're doing that. More people are getting into that. And, and, and really the benefits, I think, I think the benefits far outweigh any of the negatives that might come of it. Absolutely. And, and a lot of the custom plug makers today, they all went to that single belly now, mm -hmm. which is great. And, you know, especially if you're waiting, if it's like a lower part of the tide and I'm walking out on a sandbar and I'm in, you know, three, four foot of water and making a cast, taking a fish off the hook with extra trebles, even with pliers, uh, dangerous. With, with the one good. treble, it becomes the plug's a handle. Like, that's what I yeah. love it. You just grab it, the fish is there. Yep. You can, you don't it's have perfect. to work. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's nice. So, Shell, is there such a thing as too much bunker? Like, are there situations you run into where it's like there's just too much bait and I don't know what to do and they're not going to hit? Or how do you get around that situation or does it not exist? Like, is that not really a thing? No, it exists a lot, especially with the peanuts, uh, <laughs> especially when they're tight to the beach. and It looks like an oil slick. And uh, the way I approach it, um, I'm going to try to throw, it, throw something beyond the, the bait if I can. Um, I want that clear opening and hopefully the fish that are keeping that bait tight is going to single out my lure offering. Uh, I'll fish to the sides of it. Uh, I'll also go deep. Uh, you know, I'll go with a soft bait that's down on the bottom below that, you know, let's say we were in four or five foot of water. I want it to get near the bottom and let it twitch around down there where it looks like one of them got hurt and they'll pick that out of the school. But what happens, the primary problem that people have when it's that thick, they're funnel feeding. So the bass is going through that school of bait with his mouth open and he's just taking the bait in. He's not singling out any of them. And it's almost impossible to catch them when they're doing that. And uh, people are frustrated. You'll get one out of, you know, you'll see a thousand fish breaking water and the guy catches one here, one there, and people get frustrated. But that's the way I kind of approach it if I can to, to get better success in a situation like that. Yeah. Now, if you run into that, you've got almost too much bait you're trying your tactics of going outside taking the pockets going under if you're not finding so if it's just not working do you just keep pounding away for something to change or will you actually leave that life to try to find more cooperative life well if there's fish breaking in it i mean i know you don't want to talk about snag and drop but uh I, but this this year i didn't do it um the illegal way <laughs> uh i would carry 80 and 10 uh circle hooks with me and if, if sometimes a bait gets washed up, I would mm -hmm. just take that uh, plug off, put a circle hook on and hook. If it's a big bunker, I go through the top uh, bottom jaw out the nose and pitch it back out. If it's a peanut, I hook it on the, under the belly side and I'll pitch that out and it gets to the bottom or they just single them out because it's wounded and it's an easy meal. And I got a lot of fish doing it this year when I had that opportunity. And that doesn't always happen. You know, we weren't snagging and then taking them off and then rehooking them, which mm -hmm. is hard to do generally. But uh, we had a couple of situations where I did pretty well up in Monmouth County with the big bunker getting washed up. And they were they were hard to get. The guys around me struggled because they were really singling out the live ones. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes a huge that makes a huge. Have you ever tried like chunking? I don't know, Toby, I'm assuming you were having the same thought I just was, but I had. Have you ever tried just like straight up chunking, like netting them and chunking them yourself or something? Um, I got my 5112 with a bunker head. <laughs> so so yeah, I don't do it. I don't do it often, but uh, it's a little bit about that story. I, um, I had a guide and I took a young kid and we were catching bluefish and the bunkers were around. So we snagged a few and I put a couple in my cooler and he was fishing with me and, uh, you know, there were just bluefish around. No, no bass were being caught. And uh, I said, I'm going to put a bunker head out. I made a cast with my conventional and the kid's name was Chris. I said, Chris, you want to hold this rod? And, you know, I'll get a different outfit. He said, no, I'm going to go snag another bunker down there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're flipping. And all of a sudden, bam, I get hit. And I uh, ended up getting a 5112. <laughs> but oh, wow. uh, I don't do it that he, often. He probably never forgave himself for not accepting the offer. <laughs> <laughs> Plus the week before that, two weeks prior to that, I snagged a bunker for one of my clients, and I think I told Jerry the story where uh, he ended up getting a fifty-five pound eight ounce with that bunker. No, you didn't tell me that. I never, I've never heard that story. No. Wow. Right. Well, real quick, um, 
the, I meet at Betty and Nick's bait and tackle and I'm, I'm doing a guy with my brother, two brothers. So the one brother goes to me, says, Shelly, uh, you know, I, I started out, I said, well, how do you want to approach the day? There's a lot of bunker around. He said, well, we want to go out with you. Like you, like we weren't with you. Oh, so I yeah. said, that, that's an interesting you know, way of putting it. So we get in my truck and we're on Island beach and I'm riding along and showing them so looking at the water look for this different disturbance on the top because it was pretty calm look for bird play dolphins sometimes they'll show you where the bait is and we're riding along and all of a sudden i see dolphins in a school of bunker so i said get out of the truck the one brother i hand him one of the rods with a pencil popper i went through kind of how to work it they knew how to fish to a degree and the, the one brother with the a pencil popper rod he caught on right away but he goes my brother never got a keeper before so I go, all right, I'll do my best. And uh, I snag a bunker, hand on the rod, and he's got my bonds foul. So I walk back to him, and he goes, Shelly, how do I get it on the roller if something's ha- if I get hit or something? And the line is, Jerry, the line is peeling off the reel <laughs> like a machine. So I go, dude, put, get your index finger, get it on that roller, let it get tight, and set the hook. So he does exactly what I said, and I'm watching him fight the fish. It's in the wave. It's kind of dead low tide. And I said, let this wave help you. I said, you got a nice fish there. All of a sudden, the next wave brings it up on the beach. And I look down at him and I go, dude, you just got a fish of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah. 55 pounds, nine ounces. First keeper. Jeez. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you, you did tell me that story. I forgot that that I forgot the key part about the, the snag in the bunker. You told me that I forgot yeah. that that was the first keeper story. It's cra- That's yeah. insane. You must have been kind of freaking out. I mean, that must have really been you must have been really excited. Well, I called my wife and I, I told her, I said, because at that point I never caught a 50. And I go, I go to her, I'm riding to other locations and we just waited in and then we were still going to fish. So I get on the phone, I go to my wife, Bonnie, I go, I just got a guy, a 55 pound, nine ounce striped bass. And her words were, that's better than you catching it. Hmm. And all my buddies were high fiving me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, I've said this before in other places too. It's great for the angler who's paying the guide to catch that fish, but you did the legwork. I mean, you knew where they were. You knew the technique. You're catching it through their eyes. Exactly. You know, guide, you know, and it's rewarding. Anytime I would take anybody, including friends or relatives or strangers, it, 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 my goal is, you know, to have, let them have a great experience. What I've experienced, you know, for, you know, 70 years doing it, you know, yeah, and you've you've been guiding for a long time, right? You've done a lot of guiding. I started about 23 years ago. And you know, I'm I'm selective now though. You know, I cut back a lot. I'll take people that I know from other past years and everything. Uh but you know, I was part of Short Catch Guide Service and we started out as a fly rod kind of thing, you know, for the guiding. And then Gene Quigley and Jimmy Frieda, you know, those names, uh, they were my partners and we, you know, we used the name and everything, the Short Catch Guide Service, and it turned into a pretty good business for, you know, for them and, you know, for me as a little bit of side business. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's fun. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned something in that story that you rolled up on the beach and you were looking for the bunker and you saw the, the, the dolphins working on it. When you are getting on the beach, you're just starting your day. What are the things you're looking for to locate the schools of bunker and to know – perhaps if there's a lot of schools around, which one, is there anything other than just straight breaking fish? Is there some keys once you find them that say, this is the one I want to fish. This is where I want to target now. Once, you know, and how do you get to that point? How do you find them in the first place? What do you look for? Well, you know, a lot of, you know, bird activity possibly, because even though there's bunker schools, the, the, the seagulls will fo- follow that because they don't, you know, instinctively could be bluefish with them and then they can, um, you know, get some of the scraps possibly. Um, with a discoloration in the water, if the water's got a good green color and you see something darker in a distance, a little bit of a uh, flickering on top, then when they're splashing, we call them happy bunker. You know, the ones that are just flipping and there's millions of them. But what you want to do is ride along or get that school of bunker that's not happy. <laughs> the ones that are being chased, the non-happy bunkers are the one scared I'm ones. <laughs> and uh, it, that's basically what you know. I'll travel, you know, got to move around, you know. Um, we're fortunate because we're mobile on Island beach, which is like nine miles we could drive. Mm-hmm. And I have the permits for the other ocean County beaches that allow access. 
So we have another, you know, roughly 10 miles of beach that we could travel. Like today, we were in the northern part of um, Ocean County, not on the island. And uh, that's where all that bait was today. And um, so that's been, you know, that's usually how I'll approach it. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is uh, cell phones change the way we fish. Uh, <laughs> I have a great network network of friends. They're all good seasoned fishermen. And who's in a location that they spotted bunker, you know, maybe a mile from where I was or you know, we'll shoot up to that zone. So that today, that was like key with, you know, the communicating part with the guys. Now, do you, I've heard some guys say they can smell the bunker. If they can't see him, do you, is you it, can smell you think, yeah, yeah. On, on a west wind, you're not going to smell them, but you get that east wind. Push it in, yeah. That, yeah it has that, um, that fishy smell for sure. Yeah. Some of yeah, I've heard smell like watermelon. I don't know. I never heard that. <laughs> I was just going to say, people always say the watermelon, and I haven't picked up on that. I, it's like a, to me, it's a sweet, fishy, but I would not say watermelon. No, no. no. Can cantaloupe, no. I think, is what I've heard a lot. This, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking yeah. about there. Everybody's got weird, weird, weird sense of smell, I guess. <laughs> True. Yeah. So, what about peanuts? So, we've talked a lot about bigger bunker, but what about peanuts? How do you approach? you know, a lot of penis, because obviously, I mean, I assume there are times where that's what you've got and that's what you got to target. So what do you do when you find peanuts? Well, I'm going to scale down the size of the lures generally, you know, um, a smaller metal lip swimmer, if I'm using metal lip swimmers, uh, you could use poppers, you know, like a Polaris style, the smaller sizes could, you know, be something that'll be in that profile size. And then the soft baits, the soft baits are key when, on, on peanuts, you know, uh, the tsunami ones naturally storm. Uh, and now that no live bait needed was excellent. I don't know if you guys have fished that up by you guys. Have you yeah. used them yet? Yeah. Yeah. They're great. I haven't They're used them. Ones. familiar. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I like that bone color one. I, they don't have a pure white. I wish they would come out with a pure white. And then I like the hoagies, hoagies, paddle tail and thumper tail. I do real well with. And his stuff is great. Mike got a good product. Uh, I mean, that's basically with the peanuts. That would be my, you know, what I would, you know, go to my go-tos. And that twitch bait. Also, the Yuzuri wow. twitch bait. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been a hot lure the last two seasons. And the Quake, the Mad Mantis Quake is yeah. also a good one. That's a cool one. I like that plug. That's that's a, that's a been a personal favorite of mine in the last couple of years. It's a fun. I got the bigger fish today. The bigger fish that I caught today was on that Quake. The big the one largest, or the bigger one or the, the big, smaller one? The bigger one. Yeah, the three ounce in that, one. In the um that yellow and white pattern color. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And that, what's nice about that, it's just two hooks, you know. And they're they're far enough apart where you can deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've actually had yes. some success real well. Yeah. And I've had some fairly good success. I, I admit to anybody listening to this, I haven't worked it out so you know, take it with this grain of salt, but I have used those with single inlines and had some pretty good success with the smaller one using just one single inline. The big one I'm still working on. So I think that there's some potential there. The only thing about those is they got that fixed hanger. So, you know, you get a really big fish to twist off of it. You know, that's the only thing. But I mean, if you're on sand beach, you may not have to deal with that so much, right? Because you can right. let them run. So I didn't hear the beginning of what you I said, you know, that? so the fixed hanger lures, if they twist, right, it can twist the hook out of the mouth because you don't have the swivel. It's in the right. bottom of, you know, and the quake has a fixed hanger. But if you're on the sand beaches, you can let them run a lot more than a lot of yeah. the places I fish. I really, it's not too much of an issue. The only issue I had uh, this fall a little bit with the metal lip, um, one of them had a thin wire. Uh, it was sealed, so it, don't, it was like you're saying, it was fixed, not a barrel swivel. Right. And it got caught into the split ring. They took the whole hook off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two times it happened to me. So, you know, it's rare. But um, it's, it's not really an issue in the fact that we could let them run longer and, you know, then you could just get, you know, drive them up onto the sand and then deal with it and take the hook out. Yeah. But uh, when you're on those peat. Well, when you're on, I got a question on the peanuts. When you're on those, when you you, you, you say you downsize your, to work with the peanuts, you're basically replicating. Do you, at times, go the other way? Maybe try to replicate yeah. an adult bunker in the mix of the Absolutely. smaller ones? All right. Yeah, that's, I was going to make that point, too, but we got <laughs> sidetracked for a second. No, I'll, I'll take one of my biggest metal lips, but I'll cast it out of the school of bunker because mm -hmm. they're funnel feeding when they're in that school. 
So I'm hoping that if I cast beyond it or to the sides of it, like I mentioned earlier, I'll, you know, you got a shot at a fish singling out that bigger offering and it's going to show up. Uh, I've had success doing that. Yes, without a doubt. Do you always choose to target like so let's say you've got peanuts and adult bunker. Do you always choose the adults if you can? Or are there times when you're like, no, even though there's adults, I'm really going to target the peanuts. Does that happen? Absolutely. Yeah. This year, uh, there was a couple of times there was schools of uh, peanuts and then all of a sudden a, a school of adults, like a pod and the pod had the bigger fish. Okay. It happened up in uh, Sandy Hook a couple of times with me. And it happened recently on in, what was called Ortley Beach uh, a week ago. And the bigger fish were on the adults. Okay. And they were they were mixed. There was peanut schools and adult schools. So, yeah, so, I think you're going to do better with the bigger bait for the bigger fish. OK, so if you can see adults and you can see peanuts, you're almost always going to go with the adult bunker and leave the peanuts, 100%. even if there's more activity on the peanuts, for example. Yeah, I yeah. would definitely. OK, yeah, because yeah, yeah. Yeah. that's going to that's going to increase your chances for a larger fish generally. Yeah. But you got to mix it up. You know, it's not in stone. <laughs> yeah for sure so if there isn't blitz activity if there isn't birds and there isn't like tons of breaking fish besides just covering a ton of ground is there anything else that you do um if i'm not seeing a lot of bait you're saying basically not not visual schools i'll prospect with a pencil popper okay you know, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get in the area that looks good. Maybe there's some, you know, sandbar area or the structure on the beach looks a little different. And I'll make my longest cast I can and work a pencil popper and try to, you know, see if I could, you know, stir up uh, some activity, blind casting, you know, and you can score. I mean, because the, the stripers could be just swimming in schools or singles looking for food. And that pencil popper on top splashing with a good commotion could attract them. Yeah, nice. For sure. Yeah, okay. But that's how I would approach it. And, and then if I'm, naturally, if I'm on a mobile, I'll just jump around. I'll, I'll move, you know, a couple hundred feet down the beach or maybe a mile down the beach. Looking and then if it looks like a promising area, make some cast, jump in a truck, go from there. And then hopefully I'm going to find, I always tell people, it's nice when the fish find you, but I want to be the one that's finding some fish. Yeah, so... Yeah. Like how many miles, I mean, obviously sometimes you walk on the beach, they're right there. You drive on the beach, they're right there. But, you know, are there day like, are you covering five miles, 10 miles, 30 miles? Like how much ground are you covering before you're like, I ah, forget it, I'm done. Like how much ground do you cover? Yeah, well, we're crazy. We're nuts. Uh, we do a lot. I mean, I've been putting, I, I leave my truck. It's funny. I leave it at the halfway mark and that's as far as I let it go down. So I'm putting in $40 like every other day. <laughs> from beach this is all beach stuff <laughs> that's a lot of miles on the beach buddy that's i mean i'm crazy yeah. too i got you know i'll be like okay the tide's right i'm driving 250 miles round trip but that's on the highway most of the way not on the beach yeah. i'm getting i'm getting like three miles to the gallons it's not too good <laughs> yeah no yeah yeah but the point is if you want to find the fish you're putting in the work like you're like you're really covering ground you know i've had a couple people ask me about you know, binoculars and, you know, scoping out the fish, but you're like, nah, if, if I move a couple miles, I don't see them. I'm going to go a couple more miles. I'm going to go a couple and you're really covering ground. I'm doing that all the time, Jerry. I mean, that's the way you, you have to, to, you know, the guys that stand on the beach and there's nothing going on and they're bull crapping. Uh, I'll get in my truck. I'll go, I'm out of here. I'm going to look for something. And a lot of times I'm looking at the birds, what direction they're flying. Uh, a couple days, well, it was about a week ago, I should say, I'm on the island. And I get on what they call Gilligan's, which is the first access point. And I get on the beach, and I'm looking, and every bird is flying south. They're not even stopping to look. They're not hovering. They're just going one right after the other. So uh, I'm saying to myself, chances are they're communicating, and there's something going on, you know, maybe five, six miles up, up the, you know, down the beach. And sure enough, I just ride and ride and ride and I stop, I put the glasses on it and I go, oh my God, it's black with clouds of birds and got it to fish. Yeah. So, and you know, that's the ones I found. It would be nice if, you know, they came right to me as soon as I pulled on, that's always nice. Yeah, so yeah. Fish. Well, I mean, something a lot of people don't know is seagulls actually have like amazing vision. They can see super far. So they probably can right. see them all the way there. 
and and that's that's, the- that's really important. I mean, you know, you're really observant, and being really observant is really important in the surf, right? I mean, you know, that the point you just made that's that's interesting because I always feel that they communicate by sounds, possibly. But what you're saying, their eyesight is so keen. Yeah, because if we could see it with the naked eye, sometimes can you imagine what they see? That's right. You know? That's right. They yeah. can see. They. I. I believe. I mean, I'm no ornithologist, which is a bird scientist, but I do believe that seabirds have, like, just a plain old seagull have really good vision. They can see really far. They're not like a, a bald eagle, I don't think, but they're real. They can see very far and very clear. As far as well, I like know. how many times, like how many times you make a cast and a bird's like flew by it, and all of a sudden he flies it does a 360 and he's right on your lure or, or you throw it out and you're working it in and the bird comes out of nowhere where did it even yeah, come right. from you know right you didn't even see it. yeah it's crazy do you ever use um like to walk the dog lures like surface? oh god yeah 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 that's a that's another one i should have pointed out um with the metal lips and everything though the, the dock and now there's a lot of variations on it i do phenomenal with it um this this year was if they're the, the thing with that is it won't cast as far as a pencil popper or a regular popper. So it, the distance will be cut a little bit, but you could throw it further than a metal lip generally. Yeah. And it's, it's got that tantalizing action, that walk the dog motion. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, it's a must. And again, the bone color, white ones, and a lot of guys now, the custom plug makers are making them out of wood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is good. Those are all pretty big plugs. What tackle are you using? Uh, my go-to is, uh, you know, part of St. Croix's Pro Staff, and uh, they make great products. Not to, I want to do a commercial for you guys. Uh, it's but, okay. Uh, you can plug them. <laughs> yeah. No, I use the um, the, the uh, Legend Surf, the 11 foot, uh, and I use the 10 six, and mm-hmm. I match it up with a, either you know, my 200 von Stahl or a Z Bass 27 or the Salt X, you know, 6000, and they're supposed to come out with an 8000, which I'm. Um, you know, going to get sample as soon as that comes out. Yeah. It's a nice, it's affordable also. Yeah. I had my hands on this, the new reel that we may not talk about. That's the, the 6,000 and it's going to be a nice product. That's for sure. So yeah. you and I, I talked about that on the phone a little bit, actually. Yeah. They're smooth as silk. And you know what I like? Uh, oh, the line is perfect. It rolls on and I haven't had any issues with wind knots at all. And then, you know, talking about, you know, the braid, naturally change the way we fish uh i use 40 pound braid and that that's my go-to setup you know what, what kind of braid which yeah. which brand i like you... power pro mm-hmm. i like power pro regular straight up reg- standard regular standard green power pro nice yeah. you know and i did a seminar in bordentown in uh new jersey a number of years ago when braid uh jim bramble was the guy that introduced power pro I don't know if you know that name, but he passed away a number of years ago. Anyhow, I did the seminar and I was done with it and um, walking around their their showroom, you know, the tackle shop. And this guy, Jim Bramble, says, Shelly, did you ever see uh, Power Pro? And I go, I didn't know what he was talking about. He goes, it's a, you know, it's a braided line. I go, like Dacron? Or he goes, no, it's a eight strand, whatever kind of thing. And uh, he says, feel this. So, he, you know, he hands me a sample of it. And I, he goes, what pound test do you think that is? I go, I don't know, 10, 12. He goes, that's 50 pound test. I go, Jim, send me a spool. <laughs> it took me 1,500 yards and uh, it's on everything I own. I have, there's no, nothing with mono on any of my tackle yeah. right now. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So, Not even the uh, the vintage rig, the old school. Uh, you, you got the, the bamboo rod and the old conventional. What's on that one? That, that, that had parachute cord on it, we called it. That's a braided. Uh, it was like a nylon line uh, that we used. And the reason it soaked up the water. So mm-hmm. when we would rig deal fish, you would get that side to side action with a, with a rig deal. You wanted that S motion motion. So that's what that line was for. But I, I, amplify I, it. I took it out. My dad's right. I, you, I guess you saw the video. Of, yep. uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was fun doing it. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, Guys were like, like amazed that I could cast that thing. It's, <laughs> guys make gaffs out of those rods today, those Calcuttas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. and I've seen one of your reels that's like that in action. It's got no break. That thing starts yeah. spinning, and it's gonna. It's like a. It's like a perpetual motion machine. That thing never stops spinning. The knuckle yeah. buster. <laughs> You're yeah, very smart. I was, when I was growing up, my my dad would yell at me. We had to have some Belmore, and I 
I was like five, six years old and I'm casting conventional and I got more sinkers over to the phone lines hanging and I would cut it and then tie another sinker on, make a cast and they would come home and yell at me. <laughs> but that's <laughs> how I learned. I did it day after day. There was a little flower pot with rocks and I would make it believe I was on the jetty and I was like five, six years old doing it. It's mm. practicing, practicing, practicing. So I've got to, I, I'm going to go back to the line for a second because I got a question that I think I'm really interested to hear what you say. So you're yeah. you're 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 fishing during the daylight. It sounds like ninety nine percent of the time, at least for this kind of fishing. Um, do you use a mono or a fluoro leader? I use um, mono, um, like triple fish. I don't know if you know triple fish. Yeah, name. yeah, yeah. Oh, I use the camo, and then uh, I also use um, quattro, uh, the line, the fishing line, and I'll buy that in 30, 40, 50, 60 pound test. And I'll use that as my leader material. And I always use the camo leader, but I tie on the clear part for my snap. And then I use a barrel swivel. I'm old school. I don't use that fancy knot. Um, you know, I, not, not that I can't do it, but it, I would, you know, take me too long to try to do it correctly. <laughs> and, if, you know, I have leaders uh, tied in my leader wallet. and I'm back in the water in a second. And I don't think I sacrifice catching fish by not doing a, you know, line to line knot. Yeah. So no, I, I use the swivels too. I think Jerry does as well. It's it's just so much easier. No, actually, I don't. I, I actually do not uni. Doing it now? I'm I'm a uni to uni guy. But oh. but what I but <laughs> but what I wanted to say is, so you don't use fluoro. Toby and I are not fluoro people. We'll put it that. No. I mean, not for this, anyways. Not for you know when I go to Florida, I, I fish for tarpon. That's all I do. But you don't use I, the fluoro. I use it in uh, when I'm fly fishing. I use Sea Guard. You know, like straight 20 is what kind of my go to. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I do have fluorocarbon, you know, to use if I want to, but it's, it's not, not that I'm cheap. I'm far from cheap. I buy a lot of tackle and everything, right. but it, it's um, it's affordable. And I, I change my leaders often, you know, so, you know, you get a spool of, um, you know, 400 yards of a line or if you buy that triple fish or you want some of those spools, it's 50 yards and uh, it's not a lot of money. And you yeah. don't have to have floor. Floral is going to be triple the price for sure. Right. Exactly. So one more question I have for you, too, is we've talked a lot about open sandy beach, bunker fishing, etc. You spend a lot of time on the open beach. Do you spend and we won't go into the springtime and all that. We'll have you back to talk about that, actually, because that's going to be another really fun conversation. But do you ever target bunker anywhere outside of like the open sandy beaches? Uh, not, not that much, uh, to be honest. I mean, they could be in our inlets, you know, occasionally, but that's not usually, usually when they're in there, they're, they're traveling, you know, with the current. So they're not, they're not going to stick around, especially if the fish are on them, but more, more on the open beach. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, in the spring, in the backwater, like the Rarid and all of that, they could be in those, those places, but, uh, no more on the open surf for sure. And I get the feeling that you really like the open beach, that that's where your heart is, that you really right. like being on those open, sandy beaches. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, brought up on it, you know, from day one. And, you know, we, like my son and I, we go almost every morning and everything. And you see the sun rises and we take it for granted. You know, you see people that are from out of the town and they got their phones taking pictures of the sunrise. And we see it, you know, knock on wood almost every day. And, it, it's the best by far, but you know, I, I used to fish in the dark. I mean, that, you know, back in the seventies, eighties, nineties, I used to start at, I don't know, dusk and fish till four in the morning, get two hours sleep and go to work. <laughs> but uh, we know what that's I like. Done, I, mean, yeah. I haven't done that in a couple of years. <laughs> I used to do it backwards. <laughs> what do you mean? No, I'm teasing. I used to do people. We'd be walking for hours. I was there. I used to walk backwards doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. We make That's it harder. Funny. That's funny. Uh -huh. That's funny. Well, right. Shell, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, man, this time just flew by. I can't believe uh, how quick that just went. We loved having you. I'm going to speak for Toby. Toby, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Yeah. Uh, we loved having you. <laughs> it was fantastic. We can't wait to have you come back. There's so much stuff to talk about. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to talk to us. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge. And we are so excited to have you back. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Love to do it again.
This has been a weekly edition of the Surfcast Podcast. You can find out more about the podcast and find more episodes at surfcastpodcast.com. And be sure to check us out on social media at the Surfcast Podcast.